passion for life, as you've noticed. <clears throat> and I've had this passion for fitness and wellness for many, many years since I was a child. Um, and things come around uh, every so often. 20 years ago, ISPA and the NIH group worked together to promote health, wellness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we promised that we would all be fit and healthy, et cetera, et cetera. But we tended to be kind of on, on the periphery of that. We never quite got down to the wellness thing, OK? Uh, we got all around it, but we didn't reach it as well as we have here. So Anna and I, who were working on research together, um, talked about, OK, why is it that spas have been around and we've been trying to make everyone healthy and well and wise and all of that? Why is it um, that we're not healthier? Why is it we have more diabetes, more heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, all over the world, not, you know, just everywhere, any affluent country? So we thought of a couple of ideas, and the two ideas that came out were about happiness, or as we're going to hear from a minute from Dr. Wheel, uh, well-being, and the other thing that came out is willpower, okay? So does willpower lead to happiness? Does happiness lead to willpower? You're going to hear that soon. Um, so wellness is here to stay. Everybody listen up because for 20 years we've been playing with it. Now we've got to get serious. Um, so OK, could we hear from Dr. Wheel, please? Video? Hello, I'm Dr. Andrew Weil, Director of Integrative Health and Wellness at Miraval. I want to welcome you to the sixth annual Global Spa Summit in Aspen, Colorado. Innovation through imagination is a perfect theme. As it applies especially to healthcare in this country and to wellness. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this important occasion. The United States spends more per capita on healthcare than any country in the world by a long shot. Uh, we're now spending upwards of 15% of our gross domestic product on health care that could go as high as 20%. It's completely unsustainable. And at the same time, we have poorer health outcomes than any other developed country, any way you look at it, in terms of infant mortality, longevity, rates of chronic disease, and so forth. So the big question is, why are we not healthier if we're spending so much money on our health? Uh, and my feeling is that the, uh, the root cause of our problem is that this uh, vast enterprise that we call health care uh, is actually a disease management system that's not working very well. We're spending all of this money to manage existing disease, most of which is lifestyle related and therefore preventable. And we have to ask ourselves why we can't do a better job at prevention and health promotion. The answer simply is that they don't pay. And until we can figure out how to make them pay, we're not going to change this system. Um, the, the other reason why our medicine and health care are so expensive is that we're completely reliant on technology to solve all of our problems. That includes pharmaceutical drugs, and that technology is very expensive. Uh, our health professionals are not trained in low-cost, low-tech ways of managing common ailments, and those are all around us. Uh, health care of the future has to be based on wellness and health promotion. Um, I think the spa industry can be very central in, in that new kind of health care because uh, wellness and health promotion, healthy living have always been central in spas. So uh, I would think the spa industry could be a good source of inspiration for designing a new kind of health care. I'm afraid we're not moving in the right direction at the moment, and the problem is that as dysfunctional as our healthcare system is, it's generating rivers of money that are flowing into very few pockets. Those are the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry, the manufacturers of medical devices, and the big insurers. Uh, those vested interests have total control of our legislators. It doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And for that reason, I don't think we can expect change to come from the government. And those vested interests don't want anything to change. So I think the only hope is really through education and raised awareness and a grassroots movement that changes the political balance of power. And again, I think uh, spas could help promote that kind of grassroots movement by educating people about the importance of wellness and health promotion and prevention. 
I'm not so sure happiness is the goal of life. Uh, I think we should be open to the possibility of happiness, but it seems to me that it's much better to work toward contentment. Contentment is an inner feeling of things being fulfilled and okay that are relatively independent of external circumstances. You know, most people imagine they'll be happy if they get something they now don't have, and I don't think that's the best way to think. I think when you're healthy, uh, part of health is a, a feeling of well-being. I don't know that I would say that's the same as happiness, but I think a sense of well-being is definitely an important quality of health. You know, I think the spa community really should be working to educate people about the principles of healthy lifestyle uh, and to getting the people that it touches to be agents of change in our society. Um, I think people that come through spas should leave knowing more than they went in about how to take care of themselves, how to lead healthy lives, and how to inspire others to do so. Okay, I'm really happy uh, to bring forward Jessica Alquist. Jessica is almost finished with their PhD um, <clears throat> at Florida State University. She uh, is working under the uh, leadership of uh, Dr. Baumeister, who is uh, the guy with willpower, okay? The man to know, okay? So he sent his, I asked him for his best student since he couldn't be here, and we got Jessica. So you're gonna learn a lot about willpower, and it really applies to what we do. Go, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Uh, <laughs> so we have defined, so we use the terms willpower, self-control, self-discipline. They all mean the same thing. I'm going to use the term self-control because that's the one I'm more comfortable with. It's what we talk about in our papers, and it's probably the more familiar term to most people. But it is our ability to control our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. And all day, everyone's been talking about preventative causes in health preventative diseases, things that people can do differently in their lives that will make a huge difference in health. And I think that self-control is just fundamental to that, that nothing happens without it. Um, there were a while ago, you know, in psychology, we're always trying to find how to make people, we are at least currently trying to find how to make people's lives better. And for a while, we thought it was self-esteem. We thought if we could just make everyone feel really good about themselves, they would do all these great things and everything would be great. And self-esteem did not pan out for us at all. And Dinah can, if you want to talk about that later, I can definitely fill you in on that story. But it turns out self-control does seem to be that kind of magic skill we were looking for, the thing that we can foster in people that will really, really change their lives. Oh, oh this is my old slides. How sad. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go without these for a little bit because so I made these slides before I came to your conference and then I saw all these talks and I was like, I need to restructure this. So I'll go go on my own. How many of you have heard of the marshmallow experiment? Okay, some of you. So this is a really cool classic study in self-control. They brought in four-year-olds and they gave them a marshmallow. And they said, if you can wait till I come back to eat that marshmallow, I will give you a second marshmallow. And then they measured whether the children were able to wait or not. And if you ever look up video footage of this, you can tell that they're exercising self-control. Four-year-olds do not hide that. And they're rubbing it on their face, and they're looking at it really sadly. <laughs> and it, it's a great thing. So what they found, what was really, really cool and really far-sighted of these researchers is that they followed these kids through to high school and looked at their college admissions exams. So in the US, that's the SATs. And they found that students, the children who were better able to wait for that second marshmallow did better on their college admissions exams. And that's, and so much better. So on a 1,200 point scale, they did about 250 points better on their SATs if they were able to wait for that second marshmallow. So this was really exciting, and this brought in then a, a whole cavalcade of really great research showing the benefits of self-control. Um, self-control is a better predictor of college grades than IQ. 
which is very inspiring because IQ doesn't seem to be that controllable, but self-control probably is. Um, supervisors with better self-control are better rated by their subordinates than supervisors with poor self-control. People with better self-control report less depression, less anxiety. They report better relationships with the people they're close to. It seems to be a really broad skill that makes a huge difference in people's lives. So one thing that I think is good to know about self-control is how it works. And that's, I find it fundamentally interesting because it's what I study, but I think you will too. So I'm going to skip my old slides that I don't like anymore. <laughs> And I'm going to go to this one. So what we've found is that self-control is actually a lot like physical strength. So when you exercise a muscle, that muscle becomes fatigued. And there comes a point where you can't use it anymore. And so we found with self-control that after one act of self-control, it becomes harder for people to exercise self-control. So one of the creative ways that the researchers have studied this is, ah, <laughs> is with this cookies versus radishes study. So they gave participants a plate that contained cookies and radishes. And they told some participants that they should eat the cookies and avoid eating the radishes. This does not take self-control for most people. <laughs> In the other group, participants were told to eat the radishes and don't eat the cookies. And they made sure the cookies were like warm and gooey and were very sadistic in our lab. <laughs> and so, what we then we gave people unsolvable puzzles. So we use unsolvable puzzles to measure persistence in the face of failure. And that's been a theme these past couple days. I've heard a bunch of times people talking about dealing, moving past failure and continuing to try because eventually you're, going, you're never going to succeed if you don't keep trying. Well, these are really unsolvable, so they're really never going to succeed, but they don't know that. So what we did was, what we found was that participants who had to eat the radishes and resist the cookies then spent less time on the puzzles. So they were less able to push through, to just keep working. They were more likely to come out after seven minutes and say, I'm done. I give up. Tell me what the answer is. I want to go home. And this is one of, and that's one of many studies that have shown this basic result. So they've used all different kinds of self-control, all different kinds of measures, and this seems to be the pattern that always emerges. What we've also found is that decision-making taps into the same resource. So how many of you, after a particularly long or stressful or very taxing, self-control taxing day, go home and stare at the, open the refrigerator and just stare? And you have, <laughs> and you have no idea what you're going to eat or how you're going to make that happen. Um, and research shows that decision making relies on the same resource that self-control relies on. And this works two ways. So if you have people make a bunch of decisions in the lab, they then show poorer self-control. On the flip side, if you have people exert self-control or make a bunch of decisions and then make more decisions, they make poorer decisions. So first of all, if you, could, if you let them, they will defer the decision. They will choose not to make a decision. But if you make them make a decision, they will go with a default option. They will choose the extremes, but they're choosing suboptimally in a variety of ways. And so I've been thinking about being here at this conference. I've been thinking about the different questions that I'm talking to all of you and learning um, what the different debates are in the spa industry and things like that. I think this is sort of. This is relevant to some of the discussion about what kind of options should be available to customers, what kind of menus should be available, and things like that. And the idea is decision making does take resources. And so there is something about decision making that may take away from the restorative process. And that may not be, and maybe only if it's overwhelming, but it's something to think about. So, Self-control being a limited resource may seem like an excuse to fail at self-control, but there are really great ways to manage it. And that's why knowing that it's limited can be really beneficial. And those ways are to conserve it, to replenish it, and to strengthen it. And I'll go over the research on these various ways. So first of all, conserving it. So one thing that they found about people with high self-control is that they experience temptation less often. And part of the reason is that they structure their environment to not be overly tempting. They don't 
trust their self-control to get them through everything. They don't keep the house stocked with junk food. They don't put their video games on the computer they do work on. They keep their, their lives structured so that they're not tempted unnecessarily. And I think this is a really cool idea, the idea of setting up our environment so that we succeed. Another way, another thing people can do to conserve resources is to make lifestyle changes sequentially. So people set New Year's resolutions, they come up with five or 20 things that they want to be different about their lives, and they try to do all of them at once. And because self-control is a limited resource, it's going to be really hard for you to eat your vegetables and be nice to that coworker you don't like and go to the gym at the end of the day. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And so you can make those changes one at a time. And what's really cool is the research has shown that habits don't require self-control. So they did a study where they did a diary study where they measured what people did in the day, how much self-control they exerted, and they found that people who are in the habit of going to the gym didn't stop going to the gym when their self-control was taxed. People that weren't in the habit of going to the gym threw that out the window first thing. But the idea is that habits happen relatively automatically. You don't have to force yourself as much when something's habitual. And that's what makes it not tax self-control resources. And I think habits are a really exciting direction for making people's lives better. And what's really cool about the habit research, sorry, I have a tangent moment, is that <laughs> when people, if people want to change a behavior, the habit research shows that the best thing to do is for them to go to a new environment. And that's what you guys are. You guys are a new environment that people can establish better habits and make bigger changes in their lives because the things that cue their bad behavior aren't there. A second way is to replenish it. So the research has actually shown that self-control relies on glucose. So when people exercise self-control, afterwards their glucose drops. When glucose is low, people are more likely to fail at self-control. And to really test this, we even, so we did the, the same basic paradigm where we have two acts of self-control and see how the first affects the second but then we gave people lemonade in between. And that lemonade was either sweetened with sugar or with Splenda. And the sugar will, at least temporarily, spike their glucose. And we found that participants who were given the lemonade that was sweetened with sugar didn't show the effect of the first act of self-control on the second one. They didn't show depletion. And so we say, Sugar works in the lab, not in the diet. We used sugar because we wanted something that metabolized very quickly, that we could measure quickly, so we could send our participants home, because <laughs> they don't want to wait there forever. But the fundamental thing that comes out of this is that the brain needs fuel, and it uses a lot of fuel for self-control. So what does this say about dieting? My advisor and I don't know if dieting is the best use of self-control. And by dieting, I mean temporary, often unsustainable changes in what people eat in the service of losing weight. And the failure rates for dieting are enormous, especially if you look long term, if you look five years down the road. And we think part of the reason is that when people diet, they're denying their body the very fuel they need to control their behaviors. And so it becomes very hard to expend, do this really difficult thing, which is control yourself when you're not giving your body the fuel it needs, your brain the fuel it needs to exercise that self-control. Another thing, so the really promising direction of this research is that you can strengthen self-control. So earlier I talked about it being like a muscle where it gets fatigued after use. You can also build up the strength over time. So there's these really cool studies that they did in Australia where they measured, where they assigned people to a self-control practice condition. So participants were, this is across a bunch of different studies. So in one study, participants were assigned to an exercise program. In another study, participants were assigned to a money management program. Another study assigned participants to use their non-dominant hand for brushing their teeth and opening doorknobs and a couple other tasks. And all of these things require self-control and they found that after a certain amount of time, so there were different lengths for, different, for the different studies, but they, at minimum they were two weeks, they found that participants' self-control improved. So 
they were less depletable. So a first act of self-control had less effect on a second act of self-control. They reported losing their temper less often. The people who weren't in the money management program still said they spent less impulsively. The people who weren't in the exercise program were still exercising more. They were still building the self-control strength and it was applying across their life. They were smoking fewer cigarettes. There's a list of effects that came from the self-control practice. And something I was thinking about the other day that one of the speakers was talking about um, cultivating mindfulness in your guests, so trying to get them to focus on the moment when they're there. And I think that that fits really well with your goals and that self-control practice, the idea that you know, trying to focus ourselves in the moment takes self-control, and that's a really great kind of self-control practice because it has all the other benefits that mindfulness already has. So those, I appreciate you guys listening to me talk on self-control. If you have any questions, you should absolutely ask me. Um, but I'm really glad I got to share this today. Thank you very much, Jessica. <laughs> We're hoping to have a few minutes to talk about this in the end. So next, of course, the person that needs no introduction, Jeremy McCarthy, who is going to talk to us about happiness research. And I promise you it's exciting. And I promise you the willpower and happiness are intertwined. Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. So a few years ago, I went back to school to study applied positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And the number one question that I got from many of my colleagues in the spa industry was, oh, are you leaving the spa industry? Um, and I think that's a really interesting question when you consider that we define ourselves as places that enhance well-being across body, mind, and spirit. But we don't seem to think about the study of, of mental well-being as being a part of what we do. And I think as I look around the industry and I see the way that we tend to market ourselves around facilities, treatments, the ingredients in our products, that I have to come to the conclusion that even in the spa industry, even in the ethereal, holistic, airy-fairy, foo-foo-la-la spa world, <laughs> we focus predominantly on the physical, and we don't spend as much time as we should thinking about the psychological impact of what we do. Now, I can kind of understand why we haven't turned to psychology, because psychology for most of the last 50 to 100 years has been very negative. <laughs> So if Sigmund Freud were here with us today, he would, he would look out at all of us and, and think most of us deep inside are pretty dark and twisted. <laughs> we have all kinds of problems in our head that stem from early childhood, and the only way we'll ever overcome them is through extensive psychotherapy. So Marty Seligman in 1998 was the president of the American Psychological Association. And he felt that somewhere along the, along the way, psychology had forgotten its mission which was supposed to be to help people live better lives. But somehow, um, we had forgotten that. And after World War II, we got exclusively in the business of fixing people that were broken. So he proposed a new field of psychology that would be based on the positive side of life, positive psychology, and that it would focus not on what's wrong with people, but what is right with people, and not on what are the things that we want less of out of life, but what do we want more of out of life? positive emotions, engagement, relationships, a sense of purpose or meaning, accomplishment, all of these things that contribute to a flourishing life. So out of, over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of new research coming out, including the research on willpower, that, that helps us understand uh, much better how to live the good life. And for the first time, when you go into the self-help section, most of these books are written by researchers, and they're based on randomized control trial experiments. So we're really scientifically trying to understand what happiness is and, and what it means to us. Now, I would say the happiness stock has gone up and down throughout the course of the last three days. Um, I always hesitate a little bit to get up in front of an audience of professional, scientifically minded people and talk about happiness because happiness tends to have a bad reputation. It's very shallow, it's, it's superficial, it's somewhat hedonistic. And I think we wrestle with this in the spa industry. We wrestle with our own pampering identity. <laughs> 
And, you know, is this what we stand for in the spa is only making people feel good. And so we've tried to shy away from this and we try to focus more on wellness rather than pampering or feeling good. But the interesting thing is that there are some real serious beneficial outcomes that are tied to happiness. So happy people have better relationships, they have better marriages, they use their minds more creatively, they're better leaders, they're more successful at work, they earn more money, and they're healthier. They have better physical health and they have better mental health. So there's something about feeling good and being well which is really tied together. And I think that's something we should pay attention to. One of the researchers, uh, oh sorry, just an example of one study that has been done linking health and happiness is this study that looked at uh, the baseball cards of professional baseball players from 1952. And it turns out that the smiles on the faces of the baseball players could predict their longevity in 2009, 60 years later. And there's tons of research like that. So one of the researchers who has done a lot of work on positive emotions is Barbara Fredrickson. And Martin Seligman refers to Barbara Fredrickson as the genius of positive psychology for her broaden and build theory of positive emotions. We've known for a long time the purpose of negative emotions. Negative emotions help us to confront a problem. You are confronting an enemy, you feel anger, and you're prepared to fight. You confront a threat, you feel fear, you're prepared to flee. But why do we feel good? Why do positive emotions help us? Why has that evolved? Um, and Barbara Fredrickson's research shows that while negative emotions narrow us in to focus on a problem, positive emotions open our horizons. They open our hearts and minds, and we notice things around us that we wouldn't otherwise notice. We become open to more possibilities, and that openness leads us to learn and grow and develop resources that help us in our lives. So just to give you some examples of how this ties into wealth, uh, to wellness and health, um, one way is through relationships. So when we're in a positive state, we're more open to other people, we see similarities that we share with other people more readily, and we're more likely to build friendships and a social network. And there's all kinds of research linking having that social support network to our health. Um, George Valiant, who's the author of Aging Well and um, Spiritual Evolution, has done research through Harvard, and he says, if you ask people the question, who, who, who can you call at 2 o'clock in the morning if you need someone? You can predict someone's health with that question. The other way is positive health behaviors. So when we're in a positive state and we're feeling good, we're more likely to want to get out and pursue positive activity. You're in a negative mood, what do you want to do? You want to maybe eat ice cream, drink alcohol, watch reruns of Jersey Shore. Um, we don't get very creative when we're not in a good mood. But when you are in a good mood, suddenly you want to get out and see the world. You want to go outside and play. You want to connect with friends. And you want to pursue your goals because you're more open to the big picture of your life and what those goals mean to you. And then finally, there's all kinds of uh, research linking biological markers of health with positive emotions. So happier people tend to have better cardiovascular functioning, better immune functioning, and um, longer telomeres, um, and better response to stress. So uh, everybody in the room knows the negative impacts of stress on health. But positive emotions act as a shield, buffering us from stress. So when we're in a positive state, we actually, our stress system reacts less often. We adapt to stressors more quickly. And when our stress system does react, it goes back down to normal and gets back down to baseline more quickly. So I think there's two takeaways that I have for the spa industry on this. The first is that I think we need to get inside our customers' heads. We need to think about the definition that, we're, that we have put on ourselves, that we're offering body, mind, and spirit well-being. So we need to really think about the mental and spiritual side of that. And what we do, it, you know, the, the spa experience is not really about, in my opinion, facilities, treatments, and products. It's really, at the end of the day, about how did we make our customers feel. And I think the good news for the spa industry is we make our customers feel really good. And that is our strength. 
So when we get together and we talk about wellness, you know, I've heard over the last few days a lot of talk about being more scientific, about focusing on health, about being evidence-based, about using technology. I think those are all great ideas and we need to continue working on that. We need to get better at all of those things. But there's a lot of other healing institutions that are doing that already and they're doing it much better than we do. What we do really well is provide healing that feels good because there's no other healing institution that people look forward to going to, that people enjoy when they're there, and that people remember fondly afterwards the way they do spa. So I think as we're focusing on wellness, we should stay close to that core strength that we have, which is wellness that feels good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Jeremy, if you would say. Do you want to put chairs out? Huh? Do you want to put chairs out? No, we're going to stand. We're going to be lively. Okay. You ready for this? Okay. I'm going to ask the first question here. I want to know what comes first in the chicken and egg so sense. I want to know, is it willpower or is it happiness? How they have to interact. Okay. Because when I'm happy, I've got way more willpower. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you explain or take it away? So there's no, there's no quick um, which comes first, but there is evidence that happiness negates the effects of self-control. So in some studies, they come in and they'll, the, self, the effect of depletion. So they'll give someone a um, self-control task and then they'll come in and they'll give them like a, a little present and then they'll measure their self-control again and they don't show the depletion effect. So that's one way I think happiness definitely improves self-control and there's evidence for it. Yeah, I think uh, is this one? yeah, I think the other um, the other thing I would say, and Jessica touched on this in her presentation, but I think mindfulness is kind of the intersection of those two things. So um, the last ten years, I think mental health has really focused on happiness. I mean, you saw all the books; that's been the huge trend. I think the next ten years, the focus will be mindfulness. And so it's not, you know, kind of like Andrew Weil said, it's not about single-mindedly pursuing happiness. It's really about understanding your emotions and being able to use them to your advantage. Um, the research that I talked about with Barbara Fredrickson. She's found that there's a ratio of three positive emotions to one negative emotion that's important for flourishing. So what I think is interesting about that is it's not three to zero. It's not like we want to be happy all the time because you, you get important information about the world from your negative emotions and about what's going on inside you and, and things that are going on around you. So mindfulness is kind of being able to globally look at all of that and, and like Jessica touched on in her, in her uh, presentation, it's also that shifting of attention and being able to have the self-control to focus your attention on what makes sense based on um, you know, what's most meaningful to you. And, and I remember some of our discussions, Jeremy, you talking about two levels of happiness. So could you talk about that a little bit? Um, two levels, um, because I'm really interested in that. I want to be happy on both levels, but go for it. <laughs> um, I, think, I, I think this is the problem with the word happiness and why we've heard different opinions about happiness is that we use the word happiness all the time, but it means different things. Sometimes we use it to mean pleasure, like how we feel if we eat ice cream or have sex or do something that feels really good. But we also use it to mean, you know, someone who's just generally in a good mood all the time or, you know, seems to have a bubbly personality. Um, so it's a more of a stable personality trait. And we also use it to mean, how do we feel about our life in general? Do we feel like we have fulfilled our mission in life? And so, you know, I kind of describe it like there's the shallow end of the pool of happiness, which is more the superficial pleasure. Um, but there's also that deep side of happiness, which is, you know, on your deathbed as you look back, would you feel happy about what you had accomplished and, and the life that you had lived? So there's, you know, there's both levels of that. There's a balance. And so, Jessica, would willpower fit into both of those or, or, or maybe the, the longer range kind of happiness? Willpower, I think, really almost only fits into the long range um, view of it. There's some evidence that if people are primed to prioritize happiness, um, so if you set that as their, their goal, whatever you do, stay happy right now, people will do all kinds of bad things for themselves and will do nothing that is good for them. Because a lot of the things that are good for us maybe don't feel good in the moment, but feel good in that long range way. So happiness is really important. 
Um, but maybe putting a lot of priority on that happiness um, as an individual can lead people maybe a little bit astray as far as if they're not willing to occasionally step out of that shallow end, they're never going to get to that deep end. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think the way I see mindfulness is when you come to a fork in the, or, or the way I see willpower, and, but it also ties into mindfulness, is when you come to a fork in the road and you have to choose between that in the moment happiness or that other fork that goes to something more meaningful and perhaps long-term fulfillment, the willpower is what's going to make you go the, down the right fork. And if you don't have the willpower, then you're easily distracted by the momentary pleasure of short-term happiness. I, I think as we heard the, the people talk about life coaching and you know, behavior change and so on and so forth, I think one of the things that strikes me is health is a journey. It, it's a long-term thing. So when you're coaching people or when you have people at your spa, um, or when you have people who come to you and say, I've tried to lose weight or I've tried to do whatever, we've just learned that dieting doesn't work. Uh, we've just learned there's a lot of things that, that really need to go into the long term. So I think the question to both of you is how do we convince people that in the long term it really works? Because we're kind of wired for short term, uh, uh, short -term uh, pleasure, uh, short term you know, results. And, and so w when we read these ads about, oh, you can lose 22 pounds in three days if you just drink my fancy <laughs> detox junk, OK? Sorry. Um, anyway, so how on earth do we, do we get people around that so that they can see the long range? I actually think that maybe one of the best strategies is to set the goals more short term. I think that's something that people struggle with a lot, where there's this dichotomy between healthy and unhealthy people, and you either have to be doing everything right or you're doing everything wrong. And I think if there could be more of an emphasis on the short term, let people focus on the short term, but say, next week I'd like you to eat a vegetable a day, and let people set these very manageable short term goals. Because I think it's really hard for people to look long term. It's, it's fascinating that we're even able to imagine ourselves 50 years in the future. As far as we know, no other animal does that. And so I think it might be better to make our goals more in line with the way we think than try to maybe push our thinking too far in the future. So that's probably something we really need to think about when we have guests at our spa and we're trying to urge them to move forward too quickly. Uh, and, and the sustainability of it, then you think sustainability of whatever they're doing to become healthier probably has to be in short steps. Is, that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yes, that would be my, my inclination. So what would you say when people come to a destination and they, they come with a goal? So what would you advise us, and I'm sorry to do this to you, but what would you advise us in this industry how to encourage them to do that in a good way uh, because they all want to come to us at the end of the week and say, uh -huh, I didn't lose my 22 pounds, so you <laughs> failed. You know? So how would you, how would you handle that? I would do your best to discourage people from setting unreasonable goals. Um, there's a, I forget his name, but there's a, 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 a bookie that bets against people who go on diets. He lets them set the parameters. So they say, you know, this is how much I'm going to lose and this is how long I'm going to lose it, when I'm going to lose it by, and he bets against them and he wins 80% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so people, That's a good business model. <laughs> I think I think it's it's probably not good for health, but it it really illustrates the point. People set unreasonable goals, and if you as wellness providers can guide them toward, you know, understanding the limits of their body and understanding what what will actually be sustainable and what will actually be good for them in the long term, I think that would go a long way. Obviously, you can't convince everyone, but it would make you a big difference. Something. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think I come at this from a little different perspective because I work in the hotel spa side of the business. So I have to keep my feet grounded in reality. And we don't have people coming into my spas that are doing, you know, week long programs or trying to transform their health when they come into a spa. So I think the way that I think about it is what's the smallest thing that we can do in you know, a 60 minute window that's gonna have the biggest impact on someone? And so that's why I do think about, I do think pampering is important. I do think positive emotions are important. I think if you can 
you know, what, what are you giving your customers to think about for the hour while they're on the massage table? If you can plant a seed that gets them thinking about either something that they're thankful for, something that they're hoping for, or somebody that they love, then you've just made that hour experience into something that's going to be much more than a physical, relaxing massage experience. They're now having this great moment of appreciation and mental well-being. And I think that's what we can really do in, uh, on the hotel side where we don't have all the programs and, and options available. So I think that's great because we kind of have an answer for how we deal with people at various spas. And that's what I think is so important because all of it is so key to people's health and to, to helping our guests want to come back. Is there a quick question from the audience? We have a couple of minutes. Anybody? Question? Yes, please. Can you talk about the sugar effect on the brain? Well, or you want more? Because uh, I'm trying to repeat your question. Well, I wondered if there'd been further research done to show that if you stabilize sugar levels, it would keep a better uh, control. There if has, you stabilize sugar levels, do, do you keep a better control? There hasn't been as much research on that as we, we would like. The paper showing the effect of um, the glucose came out about four years ago. So we move very slowly because the studies take a long time. So I don't know if someone's working on that, but it definitely feels like if people's blood sugar was stabilized, if people ate better. There is some evidence that prisons that adopt healthier diets have fewer incidences of problems with their prisoners. So I think that's some evidence that speaks to maybe changing people's diets might do that. Yeah. One last question. You guys are overwhelming. You're overpowering. <laughs> One last question. Going, going. Yes, please. <laughs> so uh, have you done anything uh, with your staff or your employee care team to try to implement some uh, happiness programs? What might you suggest? Uh, yeah, th thank you for the softball, Jim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, actually, I, I sat next to Deborah Seike at dinner last night, and she told me you have to talk about employee happiness because that's such an important part of the equation. Um, so we did, I mean, a Andrea Foster mentioned earlier things that we were doing with Weston Hotels, and one of the things that we're doing is we have, an, it's called an associate engagement program, and so all of the wellness programs that we have for our guests we're trying to introduce to the employees in some way as well. So if we have superfoods on the menu in the restaurant, it's also in the staff cafeteria, and we're educating the staff on that. So I, I needed to make sure that I mentioned that so Deborah doesn't get mad at me later. Um, but the other thing that I would say is um, we, we are experimenting both on the shallow side of the pool and the deep side of the pool. So we're doing a lot with gratitude. We have gratitude journals in the spa where guests can write you know, notes of appreciation or read the messages from other people. Um, in another one of our spa concepts, we have what's called the glow board where people can leave notes of gratitude up on the board. Um, we do a ritual in one of our spa concepts where the, we ask the guests to choose before the treatment something they're thankful for, something they're hoping for, somebody they, they love, and to focus on that during their treatment. Um, and then on the deep side of the pool, we're trying to help the guests focus on the meaning behind the visit. So we kind of take it for granted. You know, there's another anniversary, another birthday party, somebody got engaged, somebody's on their honeymoon. Um, but we want to really connect to that meaning with the guest. So we've been using note cards. Um, this is actually an idea that I got from Anne McCall at uh, uh, Fairmont, where we use note cards and we allow the guests to either present note cards to each other, maybe if they're there for a couple's massage, or a personalized note card from the staff to recognize the special event that, the, that they're there for, but really making sure that we help them to experience the meaning of their visit. Okay, how about that? Let's give them a big round. <laughs> Woohoo!